bad movie beatdown. Continuing horror month is M. Night Shyamalan's The Happening. The Indian-born American wasn't always a cinematic prior. Think past the stream of stinking shit that followed, and one may remember that he has been nominated for two Oscars, for the writing and direction of 1999's The Sixth Sense, which was also nominated for Best Picture. In an all too brief few years, Shyamalan became the critic's darling, known for his suspenseful direction and regular use of the twist ending. It all came crashing down, however, in 2004 with the release of The Village, which sported a painfully predictable plot, killing all suspense. Whilst all was not lost, his decline was secured with the release of Lady in the Water, in which he arrogantly cast himself as a visionary in a film defined largely by pretentious, unthrilling drivel. The film received a thrashing by critics, rendering Shamlin's spectacular fall from grace complete. It seemed he couldn't sink any lower, but then he made The Happening, which was sold as his first R-rated movie. <sighs> Let's get on with this thing. The opening credits play across ominous shots of clouds. Actually, I think they're just ominous because of the sinister music. See, if I just change the music, it changes the whole feel. Watch. See? Aren't those some cute, cheery clouds? So he cuts to Central Park in New York City, featuring ordinary people going about their business in a perfectly ordinary fashion. Did you hear that? That's funny. That's weird. Those people look like they're clawing at themselves. You know, a key principle of film is show, don't tell, especially when you have someone spouting forced dialogue like an alien. So everyone in the park freezes and some start walking backwards. Ooh, chilling. And if you're wondering why everyone else in the park is affected but I girl isn't, I have no idea. So the forgetful girl commits suicide by stabbing herself in the neck, and from here begins M. Night's blatant exploitation of his R rating. So we cut to a construction site as the mass suicide spreads. A construction worker suddenly falls to his death in a bit so good, M. Night did it again in Devil. Then, in one of the film's most memorable shots, the rest of the construction workers proceed to throw themselves off the building. Which is incidentally the same reaction employees had at 20th Century Fox when the reviews came out. We then cut to the science class at Philadelphia High School, being taught by Elliot, played by a tonally flaccid Mark Wahlberg. Look, I don't know if you guys have heard about this article in the New York Times about honeybees vanishing. Well, apparently honeybees are disappearing all over the country. Tens of millions of them just disappearing. There's no bodies, no sign of them, they're just mysteriously gone. All right, let's hear some theories about why this might be happening. Nothing? Come on, guys. Why don't any of you care about the bees? Nicholas over here is really passionate about it. Not the bees! Ah! Oh, my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! Pollution? Could be. I mean, we're just pumping so much junk into the environment, they're just keeling over. But there are no bodies. Jake? An act of nature, and we'll never fully understand it. Nice answer, Jake. He's right. I mean, science will come up with some reason to put in the books. But in the end, it'll be just a theory. I mean, we will fail to acknowledge that there are forces at work beyond our understanding. What? That's not science! That's ideological bullshit! Very subtle subtext you have there, M. Knight. And by the way, this is a blatant red flag for some serious BS to happen later. I think Marky Mark is meant to be M. Knight's idea of a really cool teacher because he hides around the room when another teacher walks in. Dude, you're teaching science class for 15 year olds, not 3 year olds! So Elliot is called out of his class along with all the other teachers, including his best friend, the percentage obsessed maths teacher Julian, played by John Leguizamo, who is the only big name in this film not to completely embarrass himself. They are told by Cameron from Ferris Bueller that that. There appears to be an event happening. Happening! Just like the title! <laughs> very clever, M. Knight. Very clever. Central Park was just hit by what seems to be a terrorist attack. It's some kind of airborne chemical toxin that's been released in and around the park. I spoke with the head of schools. He said we should dismiss the students. So, 
Take your planners home so we can get back when this is over. It's an airborne toxin, but they're advising the students to go home. Outside. In a possible terrorist attack. Yeah, that makes sense. The kids then leave and we cut to- Ah! Bloody hell, what's up with her huge eyes? I've never seen someone's eyelids open that wide. Her eyes are like this throughout the whole movie. It makes her look like she's got serious brain damage. But anyway, this is Alma, wife of Elliot, who is extremely embarrassed about the phone ring, presumably because she is cheating on him. It sounds like there's a bee in her bag. Am I the only one who cares about the bees? So New York City has been evacuated and M. Night tries to justify his bullshit plot with scientific babble he copied out of a biology textbook. Well, our brains come equipped with a self-preservation mechanism to stop us from harmful actions. This new neurotoxin is basically flipping the preservation switch, blocking neurotransmitters in a specific order, causing specific self-damaging and catastrophic effects. Look, movie, I don't care how many scientific words you copy from the Oxford Dictionary, there's no way overriding electrochemical signals in the brain can trigger incredibly complex acts of suicide. And before you say it's shocky, it's pretty clear that Shyamalan has a message he wants to tell with this film, so I'm forced to take this bullshit for serious. So you decide to pack and go stay with Julian's family in the countryside, despite the fact that they're probably better off staying at home and stocking up on enough supplies to wait it out. The phone rings again. Hello. That's M. Night doing his trademark cameo on the phone there, and I'm sure many people have told him this, but you are not Alfred Hitchcock. So we cut to the train station with Julian and his daughter, Jess, waiting for them. Julian's wife has not been able to make the train, and we're supposed to care about her despite the fact she's never appeared on screen. Besides, it's blatantly obvious that she's going to die when she hasn't appeared on camera by now. The train pulls out from the station and Philadelphia's major park is hit by the toxin. See, that's quite chilly. Now watch. So an effective shock has turned into a demented conga line, crossing into the ridiculous and becoming unintentionally funny. The idea of it is actually much more terrifying than the visual, which, well, looks ridiculous and implausible. <gasps> a gun! I'll just shoot myself with it now! BANG! So with news of Philadelphia's scumming to the toxin reaching the train, we hear more about Julian's non-existent wife who has escaped to Princeton. The train then comes to a halt and they are ejected in the middle of nowhere. Elliot tries to get some answers. Train service has been discontinued. This will be the last stop for all passengers. Why would you just stop? You can't just leave us here. We lost contact. With whom? Everyone. Christ, why don't these people talk like human beings? This isn't a trailer, you can speak in coherent sentences. The former occupants of the train migrate into a nearby cafe, and with her mother potentially dead, Jess requires a serious cheering up. Let's see how Marky Mark turned Mr. Scientist does it. You know that everyone gives off energy, right? They got these cameras that can record what color you are when you're feeling different things. You see this ring? This ring can supposedly tell you what you're feeling. Let's see what you're feeling right now. Ooh, yellow. That's cool. That means you're about to laugh. <clears throat> yeah, she's finding the awkward and incredibly unnatural dialogue hilarious. So the crowds gather round obviously professional footage of the outbreak in the Philadelphia Zoo. Oh, look at the cute little tigers. They're ripping his arms off. Isn't that adorable? It was very nice of the camera person to just sit back and film a guy feeding himself to lions, but he was rushing back to upload that shit on YouTube. Despite initially suspecting terrorists, officials now suspect the airborne toxin triggering the suicides is a natural disaster, as the scale is too great and entirely limited to the northeastern United States. The power is cut off by something. That makes even less sense when we know what the threat is later. The people discover the attack is an airborne toxin, and they are in the center of the affected area, so their first instinct is to all rush outside and risk exposure, rather than staying where they are sheltered and with supplies. So the idiots flee, leaving the protagonist behind. Unluckily for them, one odd man offers to give them a ride. I, I run a plant nursery up the street. We're uh, picking up a few things from home, then heading wherever this isn't happening. Will you stop 
having the character say happening just because it's in the title. He needs some good synonyms, by the way, M. Knight. Okay, happening, noun, an unexpected happening, accident, affair, chance, circumstance, event, instant, occasion, occurrence, phenomenon, taking place, occurring, going on. These are all good phrases and words that people tend to use as well. So Julian's wife hasn't been on the phone and Julian chooses to go and look for her instead of taking the ride with Elliot and Alma. He entrusts Jess to their care. So they part ways and the cheese is turned up to a Eleven, making it blatantly obvious that Julian isn't returning. Look at the faraway shot of the car! Listen to the hammy score! Check out this needless slow-mo shot! Do you get it? He's gonna die! It's a meaningful moment! They pull up to the house of their drivers, which provides a good view of the nearby cooling towers, shoving the not-so-subtle environmental message further down the audience's collective throat. We're packing hot dogs for the road. You know, hot dogs get a bad rap. They got a cool shape, they Got protein? You like hot dogs, right? No, he's not under the effect of the toxin. He's just randomly started talking about hot dogs. You'd be forgiven for thinking that M. Knight hasn't held a conversation with another human being in his life. I think I know what's causing this. You do? It's the plants. They can release chemicals. And that isn't just some loony theory that a hot dog admirer has. He's actually right. The movie expects you to believe that plants suddenly turned sentient and evolved overnight. Because that's exactly how evolution works. We cut to Princeton, which is lined with hanged corpses. Luckily, we were spared the sight of tens of people going to a hardware store to buy rope and ladders in unison to hang themselves. You'd think they'd choose a more economical way of offing themselves, wouldn't you. As they drive through the town blocking the air vents and windows, they realise their doom in the pierced roof, which they're going to stare at for several minutes and do bug rule to fix it. The driver then kills them with speeded up air team, except for Julian, who somehow manages to survive, walk out of the car, and then start slashing his wrist with the broken glass. Again, this is M. Knight going a step too far. He's constantly trying to one-up himself, and it makes the scenes overdone rather than chilling. Meanwhile, the Elliot party has to stop as they spy dead bodies on the road ahead. They then meet an army private on the road, who gives them the lowdown. Uh, my name is Private Oster. I'm stationed at Westover Military Base about 10, 10 miles back. I think they've been affected by whatever's happening. <sighs> He's gonna keep using the word happening like it's clever, isn't it? Well, it bloody well isn't! It means nothing except you're an idiot! This town about eight miles behind us, there were bodies on the road into town. <sighs> Cheese and crackers. I've heard military men say plenty of things under stress. Cheese and crackers is not one of them. They're joined by another group of refugees seeking advice and alert them to the situation up ahead. Now part of a large group, they realise they're trapped between affected areas, and someone receives a call from their daughter in Princeton, confirming that Princeton has indeed been affected, and Julian is most likely dead. Uh-oh, crazy hot dog man is talking again! You know, plants have the ability to target specific threats. Tobacco plants, when attacked by Heliothus caterpillars, will send out a chemical attracting wasps to kill just those caterpillars. We don't know how plants attain these abilities. They, they just evolve very rapidly. There's a difference between plants luring wasps to kill caterpillars and plants somehow triggering human suicides. Hell, it makes more sense if it lured the missing honeybees to attack them. Am I the only one who cares about the bees? Plants have the ability to communicate with other species of plants. The trees can communicate with bushes, bushes with grass, and everything in between. So apparently trees went to themselves, Fuck the humans! We should use our previously undiscovered rapid evolution switch to kill them all! Oh, and here's a fun game now. Let's see how many times M. Knight can shoehorn the word happening into a single dialogue scene. The radio says these attacks started happening in the cities, then went to the towns, and now the roads. Whatever's happening is happening to smaller and smaller populations. That was three times in less than 30 seconds! And why the hell do they keep calling it happening when they know it's an airborne toxin, besides the fact that M. Knight thinks it sounds cute? So they are now aware that the toxin or virus or mutant trees, whatever, prioritise the larger groups of population, so in devising their way out of the affected area, they decide to... Stay together! We should go into two groups. Those that are ready to go right now, and those that need to get things from their cars, we need to stay in groups! 
Will these people ever learn? As they head off, Zoe Dashnell does her troubled walk as she gestures with all the fluency of a toddler tantrum. She decides to confess. Okay, I was gonna tell you, okay? There was this guy, his name is Joey, he's at work. We went out and we had dessert. I went out and I had dessert with him when I told you I worked late. And I'm feeling really guilty in case we're gonna die. I just wanted you to know that. You had dessert? That's dreadful. That's almost as bad as sleeping with him. What did you have? Chocolate fudge sundae? I like that one. I'm sad now. We could have had hot dogs. So now in groups, the larger group is attacked and starts shooting themselves. Mark starts freaking out in a truly laughable close-up. There were children in that group! Elliot, please tell us what to do! I need a second, okay? Why can't anybody give me a goddamn second? I'm a scientific douchebag. Identify the variables. That's the two groups. Design an experiment. That's what we're freaking out. I can't tell whether Mark Wahlberg is freaking out because of the gunfire or because he's just realised that he's horribly miscast as someone who knows what the word variables means. Elliot finally cottons on to what we figured out was happening. Shit, now I'm doing it. Although we pray to God it wasn't true. Let's just stay ahead of the wind. Yes, you did hear that correctly, a man of science just recommend they try and outrun the wind. To borrow from his late friend Julian, the chances of that being possible are a whopping 0%. He suggests breaking up into groups which will do absolutely nothing if the toxin has already been dispersed into the wind, but never mind. RUN AWAY FROM THE WIND! Unsurprisingly, they're hit by the wind, which does absolutely nothing to them whatsoever. Nothing happened. It was the size of the groups. I th could this really be happening? No, it couldn't happen because that's not how airborne toxins work. I guess the wind and the trees have been communicating with each other to target those pesky humans in packs. So they're now accompanied by two kids from the larger group. What are your names? Jared. Josh. Good thing we learnt their names before their imminent death. They spy a truck and Elliot checks it for a map. There isn't one, and instead of taking what could be an extremely useful thing for getting around, they instead spy the large house nearby, which turns out to be a show home. They arrive to get supplies and maps in order to leave? Why the hell are you leaving? You're inside and safe! You could just sit it out! You don't have to follow the military man's instructions just because he said them! My name is Elliot Moore. I'm just going to talk in a very positive manner. Giving off good vibes. We're just here to use the bathroom. And then we're just gonna leave. I hope that's okay. Plastic. I'm talking to a plastic plant. Never mind the fact that it's plastic, you're already a total dumbass because you're a science teacher talking to a plant! It doesn't have a brain, it doesn't know who you are, and it doesn't have a single clue what the hell you're saying because it's a bloody plant! And yes, they're all amazed everything is fake in a show home. See, it's an allegory for how fake and artificial our lives are and how we should get back to nature. Or at least take an interest in science. Why is this happening? You know I'm just gonna put a counter on it now because this is fucking ridiculous. There are people coming. You can't stay here, it's close to the roads. More and more people will come here. Thanks, obviously dubbed in Mark Wahlberg. Without that, this scene would make no sense. But that one line solved everything. So they leave and a large group converge on the house. The others flee whilst Elliot stays to watch a man run himself over with a lawnmower. Perhaps it would be a good idea to run away from the deadly toxin rather than stand and watch potentially exposing yourself. It's clear that Shyamalan is putting as many gory, violent scenes as possible to exploit his R rating to the max. They find another house en route and decide to try and find shelter. Oh wait, we need this relationship subplot to continue! If we're gonna die, I want you to know something. I was in a pharmacy a while ago. There was a really good looking pharmacist behind the counter. I went up and I asked where the cough syrup was. I didn't even have a cough. And I almost bought it. Are you joking? because you found a woman attractive, that would have been a total betrayal! That's even worse than having dessert with 
someone! They discover the house boarded up, but occupied, and the occupants are not very interested in seeing them. See, the people in this house are smarter than the protagonists because they've boarded up the windows and are keeping themselves inside. Unlike these idiots! We're perfectly normal. On Blackwater, keep on rolling, Mississippi moon, won't you keep on shining on me? See? We're normal. If you say so, Mr. Randomly breaks into song. So the spontaneous musical fails and the kids get aggressive, demanding entry, only for them to both get brutally shotgunned. We're supposed to care about them even though we know nothing about them besides their names. It's just M. Night tastelessly knocking up the shock value. Elliot and co. bump into a house far out of the way where they are hugely separated from large population densities. They approach it to find who's living in it, to find a strange strange old woman who utters one of the most infamously awful lines in recent cinematic history. Why I am a lemon drink. I suppose the kind thing for me to do is to offer you supper. She seems like a nice normal person and not someone who's going to knife you in your sleep. So they sit down to dinner with Brad Jones mum and she explains some of the history of the house. There's a spring house. In the back, they used to hide people from slave chasers back there. It has a, a speaking tube running under the ground to the main house. You can hear each other like you were in the same room. Hey, keep it down in there! I can hear you exposing plot points again! The old woman turns out to be a psychopath who hits children and deliberately isolates herself from the outside world without radio nor telephone. After dinner, with Jess asleep, Elliot and Alma discuss what to do, only to get caught producing a line reading so infamously bad, it actually changes the tone of the line itself. Planning on stealing something? No, ma'am, we're not. Plan on murdering me in my sleep? What? No. No, madam, of course not. I was merely going to come in the middle of the night with an extra pillow and lay it on your face. The following morning, Elliot heads through to talk to the old lady, Mrs. Jones, only to get duped. Mrs. Jones? steal my things. Yes, it is very easy to confuse an elderly person with a doll half their size. Might want to get those eyes tested, Marky Mark. There's something happening in a few states. In this region, it's not safe. Leave now! She goes outside and Elliot follows her, hoping to make amends. However, she becomes possessed by the toxin. Of course, Elliot would already be screwed if the toxin was in the air. He goes back into the house and attempts to alert the others, only for crazy Mrs. Jones to start going around smashing windows with her head like she's possessed by the plants, which makes no sense in the slightest. Elliot flees into the side room, which has the link with the spring house, where Alma and Jess are, with the windows and doors wide open because who cares about that fatal airborne toxin, right? What is so difficult about staying inside, locking the doors, and waiting for it to blow over? Pun completely intended. I mean, these people are too stupid to keep on living. Close the windows and the doors, Alma. What's going on, Elliot? What's happening here? So they have a bonding moment and he then decides to go outside and see her, allowing them to be reunited after the whole 10 minutes they've spent apart. See, they're coming back together after being separated, an obvious metaphor for the status of their relationship. You thought they've all gone outside to embrace their horrible, horrible deaths? No, because the power of love means that they survive. Yes, the mood ring is meant to imply that because of their good vibes, they all survived. I guess all those people died because they didn't love people enough. What absolute horseshit! The event must have ended before we went out there. Oh, really? Obviously dubbed in Mark Wahlberg. Did it really? I guess there are some things that can't be logically explained, like how a movie this bad actually gets made. So we cut to three months later, the to reveal the city of Philadelphia has got back to normal, despite the fact that clearly the vast majority of its population are now dead. Jess seems to be getting over the loss of both her parents fairly well, and is getting ready for the first day back at school. Oh, and it was nice of her to have an Avatar The Last Airbender bag. M. Night was obviously giving us an imminent warning on his next happening. Oh, shut it! Looking back on the incident, Shyamalan dumps his bollocks on us once again in the form of a TV debate. Kay from Mississippi. 
wants to know uh, why it started so suddenly on a Tuesday at 8.33 and then ended so suddenly at 9.27 the next morning. This was an act of nature and we'll never fully understand it. Um, no, M. Night. Nature does have rules. You can't just chalk up your plot holes to nature being mysterious and think that solves everything. We have become a threat to this planet. I don't, I don't think anybody will argue that. And this is a warning. That's right. Clean up your ways or something like this could happen. Could, I tell you, it could. It's a scientific fact. Oh, and we discovered that Alma is pregnant. Finally, she has someone to have dessert with. So we think the film's over, but no, as we cut to France, the world's butt monkey, where it starts happening once again. See? It's happening all over the world! It isn't isolated! You could be next! We're all doomed. We're all doomed. And with that, the film ends arrogantly on M. Night's name, showing everything begins and ends with him because he's the fucking shit. The Happening is a bizarre film. It seems to have been made by an alien because everything is so... off. The script is full of things that people would never say or do, acted unconvincingly by miscast actors delivering their worst performances ever. Mark Wahlberg, with his soft voice, is completely humiliated, and Zoe Dachanel makes googly eyes throughout the whole film that make her look brain dead. The science of the film is shoddy, but that's not surprising considering the green message of the film, which is laid on with no subtlety or respect for the audience. Man and science is weak, and we should all respect the power of nature and love. It's saving grace is being so incredibly unintentionally funny because it's a ridiculous film approached with a po-faced seriousness and lack of humour that is so gloriously pretentious. The film tries to make a comment on paranoia but it just ends up becoming a farce. After this, M. Night's descent into complete madness was sealed by his adaptation of the cartoon Avatar, not related to James Cameron's work, obviously, into The Last Airbender, which was critically panned and destroyed at the box office, putting his writer-director days to an end presently. He has since produced Devil, which, whilst mediocre, is certainly a step up for a director who sums up once and for all how the mighty can fall. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad movies everywhere.